let's discuss the economic rights of the women in Islam. Islam gave women the economic rights 1400 years ago, 1300 years before the Western world. When the Quran was revealed at the advent of the Prophet Muhammad, any adult woman, whether married or unmarried, she was allowed to own or disown the property without the permission of anyone else. If we read history, the first time the Westerners gave right for a married woman to own or disown the property without the permission of the husband was in 1870s under the Special Married Women Property Act. And this Special Women's Marriage Property Act was further revised in 1882 and 1897. Imagine, Islam gave rights to the woman to own or disown 1300 years before the Western world. In Islam, a woman is financially more than secured. Before she's married, it is the duty of her father and her brother. And after she's married, it's the duty of her husband and her son to look after her financial aspects, lodging, boarding, clothing, and all of the financial aspects. She need not work for a living. Financially, a woman is secured. It is the duty of the man in the house to earn the living. The financial burden is put on the shoulders of the men in Islam. But if both the ends don't meet and the woman wants to work, she can work as long as it is within the purview of the Islamic Sharia. She maintains a hijab and she follows the Quran and say hadith because there's no verse in the Quran which prohibits a woman to work as long as it is not against the Quran and the Sahih Hadith. There are many professions which are prohibited for the woman. Those professions which exhibit the body, for example, modeling, acting, dancing, all these professions, they are haram for the woman. It's prohibited. Furthermore, there are many professions which are prohibited for the woman as well as the men. For example, working in alcoholic bars, working in gambling den, doing dishonest business, cheating, bribing, all these are prohibited for both men and women. There are many professions which are noble and we want the woman to do. There are some professions which if the women want the, both the ends to meet, they can do. For example, they can do cooking at home, pottery, weaving, knitting, they can work in places which have got segregation of sexes, where the modesty is protected, where the hijab is maintained. They can take up noble professions such as teaching. They can become nurses and doctors. If I want my wife, my mother, my daughter to maintain a hijab, but natural, we should make our women folk, some of them as doctors. But if we analyze in Islam, the woman is financially secured. She need not work for a living. It is the duty of the man to look after the financial burden. Before she is married, as I mentioned, it is the duty of the father and the brother. And after she is married, it is the duty of the husband and the son to look after her lodging, boarding, clothing, and all financial aspects. She need not work. But if she works, and if that work is within the purview of the Islamic Sharia, then whatever she earns, she need not spend on the family. She can keep it for herself. That's her right. But if she wants to take part and help in the financial aspects, she can. But no one can force her. In Islam, during marriage, the woman is on the receiving end. The Quran says in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 4. Wa tu nisa satukat hinna nehla that gift to the woman in marriage a doer as a gift. In Islam, maher, that is a marital gift, is compulsory for a marriage to solemnize. Without maher, a marriage cannot solemnize in Islam. In Indian culture, where we live, it is the opposite. It is 
the woman who gives dowry to the would-be husband. In Islam, it's opposite. It is the man who gives to the would-be wife maher, a marital gift, a dower. But unfortunately, in the Muslim society, many of us have made it as a joke. You know, in India, we keep maher as 786 rupees. You can't even buy a pair of shoes with 786 rupees. And for namesake, they keep 2,000 rupees or unnis miskal. You know, saying that the Prophet kept unnis miskal as maher. If you have the same wealth as the Prophet and Hazrat Ali, may Allah be pleased with him. And if you give unnis miskal, 19 miskal, good. You may be having 10 times, 100 times more wealth than what the Prophet had and Hazrat Ali, may Allah be pleased with him. And you want to give unnis, you have to give 190, 1900 miskal if you want to follow the Prophet. They spend on the weddings lavishly. They may keep the nikah in the mosque for namesake. But a walima on a big ground, spending lakhs of rupees, millions of rupees, and they want to keep a maher as 786. They want to make a mockery of Islam. The Indian culture, unfortunately, some of the Muslims, they are being influenced by the Indian culture. You know, in Indian culture, it is the woman that gives the dowry to the would-be husband. And you know, depending upon the market, if you want to marry a graduate, you may have to give 5 lakh rupees, half a million rupees. If you want to marry an engineer, you have to give 10 lakh rupees, 1 million rupees. If you have to marry a doctor, you may have to give 50 lakh rupees, 5 million rupees. As though herds and cattle are being sold in the marketplaces. In Islam, to demand dowry from the would-be wife is haram. It is prohibited. Demanding directly or indirectly, both prohibited. You can't tell the parents of the would-be bride that my son, he likes to travel in a Mercedes car. Giving an indication, I want a Mercedes car for dowry. You know, my son, he likes to live in a three-bedroom apartment. Giving an indication that you want a three-bedroom apartment for dowry. Demanding dowry directly or indirectly is prohibited in Islam. If willingly, if the parents of the girl, the bride, want to give some gift to the daughter, there's no problem. But you cannot force or cannot ask or request directly or indirectly, it is prohibited in Islam. So if you analyze in Islam, the woman, they're on the receiving end during marriage. And furthermore, irrespective, the woman may be very rich. The wife may be very rich or she may be poor. Irrespective whether the husband is rich or poor, it is yet the duty of the husband to look after the food, clothing, lodging, and on financial aspects of the wife. He cannot say, okay, my wife is rich, I'm poor. Yet it is his duty. Furthermore, just in case, if divorce takes place, or if a woman gets widowed, she gets maintenance for the idda period, for the waiting period. And if she's pregnant, it extends till she gives delivery of the child, till she gives birth of the child. And if the child is born, she even gets financial support till the child grows up. Furthermore, in Islam, a woman even inherits. In many religions, the woman is not allowed to inherit. She does not have any share in the property left behind by her family members. But in Islam, the woman inherits. There are on many occasions where non-Muslims, the object and they say, fine, in Islam women do inherit, but why do they inherit half? Trying to say that Islam subjugates the woman. But if you analyze the logic behind it, you'll understand the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of our Creator, Almighty God. As I mentioned a few minutes earlier, in Islam, it is the man who bears the financial burden. Before a woman is married, 
It is the father and the brother. After she's married, it is the husband and the son who looks after her lodging, boarding, clothing, and all financial aspects. If you read the Quran, the inheritance is given in several places. In Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 180. In Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 240. In Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 79. In Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 19. In Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 33. In Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 106 to 108. In several places. But the most specific share, division, is given in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 11 and 12. Where it says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordained that in what you leave your wealth for your children, the sons get double the share of the daughters. If only daughters, two or more, they share into third. If only one, she gets half. The verse continues. In what you leave for your parents, each get one-sixth if you have children. The mother gets one-third if there are no children. And the verse continues. In what your wives leave for you, you get half if there are no children. You get one-fourth if there are children. What you leave for your wives, they get one-fourth. If there are no children, they get one-eighth if you have children. Don't confuse yourself. Go back home, open the Quran, Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse number 11 and 12. Easy. I do agree that most of the times, the women inherit half the amount what the men inherit. But there are occasions when they inherit equal. For example, one-sixth both for the parents, for mother and father, if they have children. But if they don't have children, mother gets one-third. That means double than that of the father. But I do agree with you, as a whole, most of the times, the woman inherit half. Son gets double than that of the daughter. Husband gets double than that of the wife. Most of the time. What is the logic behind it? The logic is, as I mentioned, since man is the person who takes the financial burden, and suppose there's a person who dies, and after giving the shares of the other people, if $150,000 or 150,000 rupees is balanced for the children after giving the shares of the other relatives, if $150,000, 150,000 rupees is balanced, and that man has got one daughter and one son. The son will get $100,000 or 100,000 rupees, and the daughter will get $50,000 or 50,000 rupees. People will say, injustice. Why did the daughter get half? But the logic behind it is, the man has the financial burden. I'm asking a question, would you want to inherit $100,000 or 100,000 rupees and spend 80 or 90% of that what you have inherited on the family if you are a man or would you prefer inheriting $50,000 or 50,000 rupees and not spending a single penny or single paisa on the family? If you are a man and if you inherit $100,000, 100,000 rupees, maybe 80 or 90% goes on the family. What is left with you? 10,000, 20,000 rupees or dollars. If you are a woman, you get $50,000 or 50,000 rupees, 100 percent you keep for yourself. So would you prefer inheriting 100,000 and keeping only 10, 20,000 with you, or would you prefer inheriting 50,000 and keeping everything with you? If Allah would have given equal amount to both, then I would have to give a talk on men's rights in Islam. When Allah has given the rights, He's even equal. If He has put the financial burden on the men, he sees to it that the men get double. Otherwise, it will be injustice. And the Quran says in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 40, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is never unjust in the least degree. So if you know the hikmah behind it, you'll realize that the guidance given by our Creator is the best. Just because the woman in Islam are financially more secured than the men, what would you say? The women in Islam, are they protected or are they subjugated?